Okay. Now, we are also uh, concerned about fines. I was always under the impression fines is to assure a person's going to return to court and the fines should not be no more than what the person can afford. Now, I've known people to be arrested for child support or traffic and held on a $75,000 fine. And especially where the child support concern is, their job is in jeopardy. You know, you can't, most judges know this person cannot afford $75,000. The individuals are being held in what they call bail as compared to fine. A bail is, and right now they have almost a routine system where bails are dependent upon the type of crime an individual commits. In our society, what distinguishes our country from other countries is you're supposed to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. There's many times that individuals are accused of crimes that they did not commit. Their bail is set extremely high to the point where it's almost a ransom as compared to a bail, and this individual is held indefinitely, sometimes two, three years before their case actually comes up for disposition when they can't afford that bail that's been set just based upon the nature of the charges themselves. So there should be a system in place where judges should scrutinize and look a lot more carefully at whether there's a likelihood of this individual being convicted and not look at merely the nature of the offense and not say that, hey, because this individual is charged with this particular offense, then we're going to keep him in custody with an extremely high bail. I think judges, no matter what their prior record is, no matter what they've done in the past, I think the major criteria for setting a bail should be not only the nature of the offense, but the likelihood of conviction and how strong the proofs are. Okay. Okay. Um, we are also concerned about what is happening in the prisons today. You know, uh, we also thought about maybe there should be cameras all throughout the prison. When uh, Judge Walton came up in March, he discussed about the rapes in jail. Well, they have found guns in our jails here in uh, New Jersey recently, uh, this gang problem in jail. How can we prevent a lot of the abuse that goes on in jail? There is a lot of violence being committed against individuals that be in house in our jails, both pre-conviction and post-conviction. What you need is you need correction officers that care, correction officers that are more concerned with the safety of the prisoners than their lunch hour or dinner hour. What you have is you have pods, you have tiers that are being manned. Hundred, you have a hundred prisoners being watched by two individuals. You have cases where there's no cameras, like you stated, on those tiers, so that if something happens, the correction officer doesn't even know that it's happening, because it happens in a private area, in a cell, at night when the correction officers are sleeping, or they're short-staffed. What we need to do is, A, we need to hire more correction officers to patrol and watch those tears. We need to take the correction officers out of a essentially a cell themselves and make them patrol the tears, be there with the prisoners at all times. And like you stated, I think that we need, if we don't have enough correction officers to actually be in the tears, be in the pods, be with the prisoners so they could watch them on a 24-hour basis, then we need to put cameras and have a central system where an individual is watching the cameras to make a determination as to whether someone's being assaulted or injured in prison. I think it's the job of the Department of Corrections and the Bureau of Prisons, if you're a federal prisoner, to protect the prisoner. It's their obligation, it's their duty, they're not doing that very well. Well, I'm sure you're right about that because um, they have more problems in jail than it is on the streets. Another concern, a few years ago we designed a program called Patch Up the Cracks. Now, Patch helps to structure and monitor activities of those who have committed infractions of the law and we give a report to probation and the courts about what this person is doing. 
Uh, there's an outcry for the community to get involved. And as you know, Creative Spirits is a community-driven and people-led organization. And we want to work with the courts so that we can help our community to overcome some of the difficulties. And they're telling us that they do not need the patch program. In the meantime, our youth are falling through the cracks. So we want to know how can we encourage the courts to accept these programs, that they need them, and also do you believe a person can overcome problems better by this type of intervention instead of going into these problem jails? I'm convinced that an individual needs a support system. They need individuals that care about them if they are alleviate their problems, overcome them, and move on with their life. What we're doing is we're sending individuals out after serving custodial sentences into a society where they have no jobs, they have very little education, they have absolutely no means to support themselves or their families. So the only means and methods that they know so that they can eat, so that they can house themselves, so they can close themselves, so they can take care of their families and children is to return to the streets and earn a dollar illegally. What we're not doing is we're not allowing the community into their lives so they have a support system. If we would have a mentor program, we would have, and many individuals that commit crimes come from single family homes, broken families. They don't have the foundation that instills education in them. They don't have the foundation that instills values in them. And the only way that could, that could be done, because you can't do it with tax dollars, is to have community type programs like the Ministry of Justice where you have mentors that associate themselves with individuals before they get out of the prison system and they assist them in learning what's right, wrong, a value system. At least someone that they could talk to, someone that they could turn to when they feel desperation, when they feel a need to return to the streets. You don't have that. You need better systems better rehabilitation, where individuals are going into prison with drug problems, they're obtaining as much drugs in prison as they do out on the streets. So they're not alleviating the genesis of their problems, and they merely return from prison out onto the streets with that same severe addiction, which leads them to commit crimes to support the addiction. You have individuals that are gang members, that in prison, they actually structured where they remain with that gang and their fellow gang members. If you're a blood or a crypt or a Latin king, they actually put you in prison in a section with those individuals, with your fellow Latin kings or crypts or bloods. So what does that do? That instills the value of that gang and that individual so that when they get back out in the society, what do they do? They turn to that foundation, that value, that supports us and that family and the only family they know, that gang family. So what we're doing is we're creating revolving doors. What we need to do is we need to better educate, better vocationalize, and we need to have a support and mentor system for individuals to separate them from that caste system that they come from. Well, you know, Ron, you really convinced me that we we're on the right track and what we're doing and I thank you for the support that you have given Creative Spirits along with educating us about what we need to do and we're looking forward for your continued support and helping us to get our plans and ideas out there.